So today we will talk about Portland cement. And all the fun, this is actually a pretty cool lecture. Maybe it's just I love cement, but um, again, this is the Alamo cement plant where I used to work down in San Antonio, Texas. It's about a $1.2 billion for the B cement plant. This is uh, the Maryville cement plant. So it's over by Sweetwater Abilene area in Texas. Uh, they just just re-updated it about three years ago. Over there in the far left is from Greencastle, Indiana, which is south of Indianapolis. Here is actually on the, the uh, Mississippi River, in Festus, Missouri, which is south of St. Louis by about an hour. This is Chattanooga, Tennessee. And then trying to remember. Yeah, and the other one over on the left is the uh, it was also on the Mississippi River, farther down south in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. So it's actually almost to the very far south, um, what uh, east of Missouri. Um, and then I had another plant up in Pennsylvania. So. Manufacturing cement, literally you're taking limestone, sand, and clay normally. There's, there's a lot of other materials you can use. And you are putting it through this expensive plant, and it comes out to this powder. So there's really, in my world, five basic uh, cement, cement making processes. You, you go and you collect your limestone and other materials that you're going to use. And then you take it and you put it through a raw mill. So you take the raw materials, you grind them up into a very, very fine powder. Put it through a kiln, which is a hot oven. It melts those raw materials down into like a lava. So it's like inside this kiln is like a volcano. It's like it literally it looks like a volcano. It's lava. Um, and then by the end of the kiln, there's a clinker cooler and it actually uh, cools down that material into a clinker, these little gray balls I'll show you pictures of. Then you have your finish mill. Your finish mill takes clinker, gypsum, and maybe some other herbs and spices. And um, it actually grinds everything down into that little gray powder that you think of. And then it gets put into uh, usually silos. And then they will eventually ship it. So I'm going to go through the basic process today of, of, of each of these. So you collect your raw materials. Usually you're going to be on site of some type of quarry that has most of your calcium. And you're going to take out, uh, you're going to take that limestone or, uh, or whatever, whatever other source you're going to be using. There's lots of different uh, smaller ones. And then you're going to crush it down into a primary crusher, just like you do with aggregates. You may even do a secondary crusher, and then it'll actually be stored in a in a in a, uh, a lot of times a silo or something like that. So your goal, whenever you're making cement, is you're trying to find different chemical compositions. You want so much of calcium, so much silica, so much aluminum. So much iron. Gypsum, the sulfate, is actually at the very end. But so the, fir the first four, though, that iron, alumina, silica, and, and calcium, those are really where you're trying to figure out how to blend a bunch of materials together to, to get the right uh, chemical composition for your cement. Um, mudstone is probably the second most common, and then shell. Um, to be used. So a lot of times, like in Oklahoma, the, our, our cement plants here use about 85% limestone. And that has most of the, the calcium that we need. And it will have uh, 
some of the silica. You may add a, a clay or a little bit of sand to, to get that silica and that alumina. But there's a lot of different materials that you can use. I'm going to focus on this top one up here. There's only, I think, one plant in existence. And it was uh, um, in, in the United States that uses a, a semi-wet process. So don't even pay attention to this one. But the one up there, and there's actually better, maybe even a better picture in your PCA design and control book. But what you're going to do is you're going to take, you look at that very far left here. So this is the limestone, sand, clay, or whatever you're going to use. And um, there may even be in silos or they may just be on the ground. And you're going to actually batch out, put them on a conveyor belt, um, different, uh, the different proportions to get the right chemical composition. And then you're going to put it through this grinding mill. And you need to make sure that this grinding mill, that, that, that grinds strong enough. So there'll actually be quality control here to make sure not only the chemical composition is correct, but they have a uh, ground fine enough. And then it'll get put through with, um, these silos, these raw, raw silos here. And so for most plants, they actually get blown in where they get blown and put through the silos and they'll actually mix up um, really well. So I won't go through the wet process in here, but that raw mill, you want to have about 80 to 95% past the number uh, 325 sieve. What is the th number 325 sieve again? Yeah, it's really small. It's finer than 200, so there's 325 holes per one linear inch. It's really, 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 really small. And what this does is it allows that powder to, to easily be burned and traded into that lava. And you can run um, x-ray fluorescence on it. Um, you can also have what's really cool, we've developed cross belt analyzers where um, as it's moving past the raw mill, you can actually um, shoot it with with this x-ray and it'll actually tell you in real time exactly where uh, on that cross belt what your chemical composition is. So pretty cool. The third step after you go from the raw mill, you have a finish or you have a your kiln. So you take that little that raw mix, you put it through a kiln. You may have at the very, very front, you may have a preheater tower to kind of heat up all the materials so that you are a little bit more energy efficient. And then you put it through this kiln at about 200 degrees, uh, 2000 degrees Celsius or about 2700 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's on a, these are, you know, these are uh, horizontal kilns. They're on a slight slope, and all they do is they rotate over time. And out the back end, again, by this time, the, the, the clinker's cooled and it falls down. And so the heating process from the very start of that kiln to the very end is really important. And then this clinker cooler is also really important in the formation of the chemical composition and then also um, the actual uh, the formation of that chemical composition, the, what it uh, physically looks like, can be a huge deal. Then you also, uh, you'll put it maybe in clinker silos. If this gets too full, you'll actually go out and put it on the ground somewhere. Maybe hopefully you have like an overhead um, place where you can actually store it. Because if this is out in the open too long, it'll actually start decomposing pretty well and you won't want to use it. So preheater tower, like I was talking about up there, you have the kiln right there, and then you have your clinker silos. So um, 
And there's actually one more that I helped build back there. Um, but that's for another day. So the, the flux is what it's called that middle that plane that's inside this kiln. And again, this whole thing's turning. This is a picture of the prior Oklahoma plant. So that is uh, north and, and uh, straight, well, north and east of uh, Tulsa. And this is kind of what the illustration of the clinker cooler looks like. So that, those little clinker balls, that's kind of what they look like when they come out. Obviously, it's really cool here. You wouldn't want to touch that with your, you know, with your hand if it was hotter. Um, so that's kind of a picture there, kind of what it looks like in general when in color. Um, normally, whenever I work for a cement company, I just bring a five-gallon bucket and pass the, the clinker balls out. The people like to have, you know, have something, but um, I ran out, so sorry. Um, so chemical analysis will actually be done with the clinker also with an XRD. Um, this thing's kind of cool because you can actually take and heat up um, um, and actually heat it up. And so you can actually see it all melt again um, and put it a little, uh, put it in a little, it actually turns into glass looking and you can analyze it. It's kind of cool. We can also go and actually take that little ball of clinker, cut it in half, and then polish it. And then with some dyes, we can actually go and make each of those individual, the chemical composition look different. And we can actually look at the shape of them. Um, and then the different chemical composition of that cement, we can make sure that we're not getting too big of C2S, um, we can actually see our C3A in these little bitty dots. And we can kind of make sure that we're not having odd shaped clinker. Because if you have some, start having some really odd shapes, then you need to change your burning process and maybe slow down things. Um, there's a lot of different steps depending on what your process is. Then your last step, pretty much there's a lot that's kind of going on in this picture. This is, is a lot of your uh, air emissions and stuff. What I want you to focus on is this grinding mill. Take your clinker, your gypsum, and maybe you have limestone addition or something, and you are going to put it through this grinding mill called a finish mill. And that produces the finished product, and that will actually be uh, put over in, in silos until you can ship it. So. You might say, Dan, why are you got gypsum with that clinker? What's going on? Well, this is gypsum. And you add it to, to the clinker to control flash set. So the C3A can rapidly set in such a way um, where all of a sudden it just concrete sets up and it can be real scary. So we add gypsum to control that. So we have more time to place the concrete. Um, and there's kind of a balance there. And if you, and, and how we control hydration in general, um, you can only add so much gypsum. So then, you know, you can use chemical admixtures and stuff for your specific application um, whenever you're actually going out and placing concrete. So this is what, this is how we control um, in the cement part, we can control some of the uh, um, setting up, but it's really, um, we kind of meet the standard. And then, you know, for your application, if you want it to speed up or slow down, you use chemical admixtures to, to a lot of times do that. And we'll go through a lot of that whenever we're talking about placing concrete and how all that kind of works together. So this is a ball mill. That's the outside, this is the inside. There's these big sphere balls about the size of my fist, maybe not yours, but the size of mine. I got pretty big hands, and um, there are some that are different sizes. Um, it just depends on um, it, it just depends on, on on the finish mill, but they can be some different sizes. But usually they're pretty good size, 
and, and this thing turns and these balls just sit there and crush, um, crush it. So, and it turns in a certain way where on one side it's, it's grinding it and then the other side there's actually product coming out. This is a vertical one where if you take like, like pepper, regular pepper that you're grinding um, and you're eating a little pepper on your mashed potatoes or something, pretty much works the same way where you have a grinding table with cement coming down and you just grind it and it just comes out. So that's kind of what people are starting to, to focus more on is vertical mills. Um, so there's kind of a battle between which one are they going to use, ball mills or, or vertical mills. And so I think it sometimes these vertical mills, people have noticed that they actually are so good that they speed up the cement too much um, where they can't meet the spec or that's too hard to. And so um, the Mary Mill plant that I, that I helped work on, they actually um, went with a, with a ball mill um, and a finished mill because they make different types of cement. So it's kind of cool to see all that. So whenever you take your cement and you ship it, there's a lot of different ways you can ship it. Um, again, you have your silos here. You also have silos there. You can actually take a train truck, train truck, build up for a rail car, or you can just drive a semi truck. Those are actually semi trucks at the Greencastle plant in Indiana, and they'll actually just fill them up in there. Again, this is a cement truck at the Alamo plant. Um, rail cars are are uh, are uh, moved all over the United States to transport cement. They go to terminals. This is up in Michigan, and they're uh, blown up into silos. And then the trucks will drive up there. They got a scale, and they'll actually weigh them out. This is actually in the New Orleans terminal. Whenever uh, um, we're taking cement from around the world and shipping it to the United States because we don't have enough cement, um, we'll actually take this kind of like a vacuum, where it just sucks all the cement out of this barge. It's kind of cool how it's done. Um, and then it'll be put onto either a rail car or in a silo. Um, this is actually bag product. So you can, you know, bag it up at the plant and then ship those bags to, um, usually it's to material suppliers. And then those material suppliers, like, uh, like around here, uh, it would be like places like Maxwell Supply, stuff like that, um, and they'll have it. You can also ship it to places like Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, this is the Festus plant before their add-on. I don't have a new aerial view, but Mississippi River's up here. So they actually will barge up and down. They'll ship a bunch of cement up to Chicago and even go down to New Orleans whenever we don't have enough cement down there. So there's the quarry. Here's your raw materials. Then you have your raw mill, which is usually on one side, which grinds all those raw materials together. Then it gets stuck through that kiln, that, that, that oven, that really hot oven, turns everything into lava. Comes out the other side of the clinker, it gets cooled. Then you have your finish mill which is normally kind of right beside your raw mill. And then you have your cement storage silos. So what's on the other side? What do you mean other side? Well, it's past the kiln. Does it go down and loop back around? Yeah. So you got your so raw mill, then your kiln. Then your raw mill. And then it will, it will go down here. And then this is actually your, your clinker silos. So then, then what they'll do is they'll move it back, um, move that clinker back over here to your finish mill. So some of that stuff's underneath. Some of it's actually on a conveyor belt. It just depends on what you're what you're looking at. Um, 
and then a semi wet really instead of it instead of you blowing um instead of you blowing the, the raw material into these silos and mixing it up they actually use a big tank a slurry tank so these gigantic tanks and it just the, they add water and they mix it up um and this plant has done a really good job because they've been able to use alternative fuels to to do that um so they're becoming very very green so the control room is kind of the place where there's a bunch of monitors and people just sit back there and they're just monitoring and controlling and making sure the plant's uh, functioning right. And it's kind of cool sitting there watching because you may have from one side of the room to the other, you may just have monitors all right there. And then there's just people sitting behind it, um, looking at different stages and monitoring different stages. And um, there's a lot of different pressure um make sure there's no issues with any with any part of the plant um and then there'll be alarms if there are so this is just kind of some screenshots and there's a lot of different processes and a lot of stuff they're looking at um so it's, it's pretty cool it's better than a bunch of people just sitting there at, at the different stations all the time uh throughout the plant that would that'd, that'd be very expensive um, so the quality that happens through this process is down here at the bottom. So the process, those five different stages I talked about. So the raw materials like the limestone, the clay, the sand, they'll actually be analyzed for, for the chemist, chemical composition. Uh, maybe even before they even go to the, the raw mill, they'll be made sure that they, they have the right material. It's fairly consistent, not changing. If it is, then how do you balance that out? Then it'll go through the raw mill, make sure that it's, that's fine enough and the chemistry, that blend of chemistry is right. Through the key clinker, you actually look at the crystalline structure and the actual uh, chemistry of that clinker to make sure it's going to react properly and perform. And then through the finished mill, that actual end product, you'll actually go through and look at like things like hardening of the concrete, the chemical composition. You actually break cubes um, for the strength to see how consistent it is. So there's a lot of different uh, properties that they'll look at. So the specific gravity of cement is assumed to be 3.15 um, based on AS, uh, ASTM C150. But it's not exactly perfect, but it, it's a good enough number. So this is Blaine, Vicat. Again, they have like two by two little cubes that they'll break for their strengths, their mortar cubes. Vicat, they have a needle, a little bitty needle, and it's for mortar samples. And they'll poke this little needle and see how far it goes down in there. And eventually when it stops going down in there, um, they'll actually can measure, you know, your initial set and your final set from the bycat. So it kind of gives a good consistency there. Blaine actually blows air through the cement sample to measure the surface area. Um, normally, you're going to get some type of mill cert. So all the chemical data, all the stuff they tested, is going to be provided on this mill cert. So you're going to find the chemical data and then you have some physical data. So most people are going to look at things like the strengths, the bycat, the C3A content. Um, so these two, so the three C3A, it's kind of important for your initial set and then how your, your different uh, chemical admixtures may interact together. Your strengths, especially, you know, maybe it's one, three, seven, 28 days, depending on what you're exactly looking for. Um, some markets will focus a lot on the one days or the sevens. <coughs> Other ones I'll see that'll really focus on the 28s and, and the threes. So I don't, I don't I, you know, I think it just depends on what people are, um, how they learn cement. So there's a lot on this mill cert. Um, 
You can also have shipping samples or you know you can actually take from the rail car or, or wherever. Um, you can actually go and go back and do the compressive strengths to see over time if that sample's been uh, setting in that silo for say um, four weeks. How consistent is it? Or am I still getting the same um, consistent sample at the plant as I am whenever it gets shipped to the terminal that's 600 miles away? So you can actually, they have reports that it can actually communicate the consistency of their cement. Um, so we talked about how you can use an XRD or XRF, use x-rays to go out and actually measure the chemical composition. So unhydrated, so just the cement before it gets to, it touches any water, these are the different chemical compositions. The major, the major compounds, A light, B light, and luminate. So this is shorthand chemistry. So it's calcium, uh, tricalcium, uh, uh, tricalcium. So it's not just carbons. This is calcium. This is silicate. This is alumina. So tricalcium alumina. Um, B light is dicalcium silicate, and then tricalcium silicate. So um the chemists just kind of do shorthand for for that are chemistry or uh, cement chemist so this kind of provides you some of your short-term gain this is long-term gain so roman concrete has a lot more b light and they don't have as much of this a light and so that's why one of the reasons why you had to wait for like 180 days to really put a lot of heavy traffic on there but this B light works really well. So who in here has been in a bar fight? Anybody? All right. So back back a long time ago, um, I used to bounce at a, at a bar. I noticed whenever people would get in fights that if somebody uh, drank a lot of alcohol and they were punched in the face, what would happen? They go like that. But if somebody didn't drink very much alcohol and they got in a fight and got punched in the face, they just, you know, they just take it right there on maybe the chin, maybe break their jaw. But that drunk would kind of flail. And so they had more uh, ability to take that force that was put on their jaw and spread it out through their body, maybe hit a wall, whatever. And they were able to not to break their jaw. So this B light kind of does the same way where it actually transfers more of that load throughout the uh, concrete. The CPA, even though it does provide a lot more short form strength, um, it doesn't do as good of a job of actually distributing um, throughout the system. Then you have your, your C3A, which is your initial set. So this can really play with um, your, your, your early strengths and your early set doesn't have a lot of uh, doesn't have a lot of effect with your later days. So so short. So this A light is really like within 28 days. B light is more like 56 to 90 days. And this is really your one your one to three days is really when it um, when it changes. So. So compressive strength, like I said, the two by two little mortar cubes, it's not the same thing as a concrete um, cylinder. So be aware of that, but it's about consistency at the plant to make sure that there's no, there's no problems. And then you have, like I said before, the blame fineness. So how fine that the cement particle distribution, how, uh, where it's at. Um, so for type, type, one or type two cement you may have a blame of around um you know 3800 but a type three cement you're going to grind that type uh that type two clinker type one clinker really finer so it may be more like six thousand so maybe double um the blame so as the blame goes up the finer the um, cement is
You also look at consistency. You can actually make a table flow. So you can take this little table here. It bounces actually up and down. Um, and you can make a little sample, take the mortar away, pull that little cone, that little ring out, make that table bounce up and down. And then uh, uh, with, a, with a X amount of, <coughs> like, um, with X amount of, of it going up and down and bouncing, it'll actually spread out and you can measure the diameter. You also have soundness to make sure that that cement's not going to expand too much. So they'll, they'll put they'll put it in this this big pressure chamber and um, try to expand it. You can also go and heat up the cement really to some pretty high temperatures to make sure there's no water and other impurities um, in that cement. Like I said before, the specific gravity of cement is. 3.15 and specific gravity that's like talking about um, it's, it compares the density of a material to water so if you have water same volume cement and water say maybe the water weighed 100 pounds your cement's going to weigh 310 pounds if they're the same volume and what that is the specific gravity it's really a ratio so it'll be three, three times, a little over three times more um, than, than the weight of water. We talk about, some people will design mixes and they'll talk about sack contents. So a sack of cement, one sack of big Portland cement should be 94 pounds. Back in the day when it was loose, that actually equaled a cubic foot. So when you designed, it actually made a lot of sense to talk about sacks. Today, our cement's a lot more compact, so it's actually uh, about half, um, you know, whenever it's compact. So now we don't focus on uh, as sacks as much like they did back in the day. We actually look at tons. It's, Cement gets sold by tons, so we we'll look at pounds. So how many, you know, is it 500 pounds of, of cement now um, in your in your one yard of concrete? We also had stuff back in the day. We had barrels, so four sacks equaled one barrel. Whenever they were getting shipped all over the world, um, that's kind of how that's kind of how they they did stuff. So now we deal with trucks, uh, cement trucks. So we look at per ton when you buy it. There's a variety of different cement products that, that, that can be used. Um, obviously for this class, we'll be a lot more focused on your, on your Portland cements. So type one cement, type two, type three, and type five. Um, but, you know, they, they make a masonry cement in, in prior Oklahoma. They made a, a, a lot of different specialty type cements for, for oil well. Um, a really fast setting C3A con or C3, um, yeah, C3A. Um, so if you go to Lowe's, you buy a big bag of Quick Creek that's red and it says rapid setting cement. That, that cement was actually made in prior Oklahoma. And then they ship it to their distribution place where they actually blend it. So they blend it with X amount of type. Um, type two or type one cement, but in prior, they actually make a really specialty product that reacts super quick. So within 15 minutes, you can have um, concrete that's already set up. And then within, an, within uh, six hours, it makes 6,000 PSI concrete. So high strength concrete, boom, um, really quickly. And so they'll actually put some of that in there. So that's kind of the specialty ingredient um, in that red bag of Quick Creek. Is it a lot more expensive? About, depending on who, depending on what it is, it's at least, it's at least twice as, two to three times as much to make. And then they sell it for, you know, a lot more than that. So, um, it's, it's a specialty product. 
So, but yeah, that's why they blend it with like a type one or a type two, just to one to control it a little bit more. Um, and then two for, for, for economical prep pr uh, purposes. But like I've talked about before, there's actually technically five types of Portland cement. Type four is not really used. Type one, two, and five uh, deal a lot more with the C3A content. So as you reduce the C3A, you have a lot more sulfate resistance. So a C3A um, of 8% is type 2. C3A content of 5 or less is type 5. And then your type 3, the early age strength, usually from a type 1 or a type 2 clinker that's grinding and finer. So the blains, you know, maybe at 3,800 here. For type 3, it's more like at 6,000. So type 1, you can pretty much use it for whatever. Um, for most, you know, general applications. A type 2 is, a lot of times is the same way where they just, there might be a place that just naturally makes a type 2 cement, but it does meet the requirements of a type 1. So they make call it a type 1-2. And this is a moderate sulfate. So if you have sulfates in your soils and you're worried about the sulfates attacking the concrete, um, especially that C3A, then you may want to use a type two cement. And they're pretty common. Uh, if you're going to use like concrete pipe drainage, you're going to have to use like a type, type two or type five cement, depending on how, how much it is. It also helps that C3A getting lowered also helps the heat of hydration, so how much heat's being produced. Again, a type three, high early strength that's used at precast facilities. Um, it's just a really quick reacting cement, so you can make those beams, and you can move the, uh, and then move them off the form beam, the, uh, the line real quick, so the beam line, you can make them, cast them, and then within maybe uh, 12 to, to 24 hours actually move that beam off and let it keep curing and you make another beam it's all about production so you want to you want to get it in, get in get it out as quick as possible without spending too much money again type five was four was made for the hoover dam um, you can use a type type uh, type two cement with class f fly ash and do a pretty good job with it type five when you get down around ocean, uh, oceans, a lot of times they'll want to use a type five, especially when it's actually in the, um, when there's, you know, an actual piers are actually setting on water. Um, so, you know, you can use a type two sometimes with a class F fly ash, um, but there's not a lot of class type fives that are being made. Like I said, I think there's about eight different plants. So there are a lot of other specialty um, cements, a lot of different colored cements you can use. You can have some that actually expand. You have rapid setting, like I talked about with the red bag in Quick Creek. Um, you can have masonry cements, which really is a, a type one or a type two cement with performance additives. So they have air entrainment in it, and then they have a bunch of filler material. So it's a lot weaker masonry um, that gravels. And then you, every once in a while, find a performance cement that's been used, but it's not as common. They're more common in Europe. So is there any questions? We'll talk a little bit more about um, um, secondary cementitious materials, so other things other than Portland cement. We'll talk more about hydration too for the next coming up lectures. So, anyways, don't forget about your homework. Have a good weekend.